Randolph will be speaking. His topic is why was Haiti in 2010, the next Tangshan of 1976. The question of Tangshan. Tangshan is sort of the watershed event in terms of earthquakes in our lifespan and in world history. It apparently wasn't the largest. Death toll from an earthquake ever in history. There was one about 500 years ago that was bigger than this,、uh, also in China, of course.、Um, but、um, the、uh, Tangshan earthquake, certainly,、uh, the difference between that and that de- defines what an earthquake can do. Now, the Haiti earthquake, the official Haitian government death toll, is 316,000 people. And、uh, so the question is: Is it Trump Tangshan? And I'm going to take you there. And in, by the end of my talk, I'm going to see whether I have a chance to convince you that not only are historical buildings often resilient on their own, but in many times they are better, strong, more resilient. I'll say more resilient, not stronger, but more resilient than modern buildings. And in fact, they can lead us into a place where we can define a new way of building modern buildings. So,、uh, looking at Haiti,、um, would it be a big surprise to find this、uh, kind of scene not to be similar to that of Tangshan? The downtown devastation was all over the world's newspapers, and、uh, when you see the Uh, informal settlements. A large part of Port-au-Prince was informal settlements. People building their own houses, also out of concrete. Never any day of training on how to build. Well, of course they would all fall down. Correct. Well, we need to look at that a little bit more carefully. So here are the official numbers, and you go on to Wikipedia. A MMI 10 is what is listed for Haiti. But this was only a moment magnitude of 7.0 as an earthquake. So how do you get there? Well, it didn't go there, and I'm going to show you why using the very methodology that has been used in places where we haven't had instrumentation for a hundred years. And if you look at what an MMI 10 is, most masonry buildings, the masonry buildings are used as the calibration for. A Mercalli scale、uh, assessment of what the actual shaking on the ground is over about an MMI seven. Now look at MMI seven. So there's the MMI ten, but look at that one now. Now I'm going to take you there. So a rubble stone masonry building. I would classify that probably as poor construction in masonry. Almost on its face, no matter what rubble stone building you could find, rubble stone itself, particularly river rock, is not considered a good building material in earthquakes. I think most people in this business would agree with me. But is this enough to rate this earthquake in an MMI seven? Because the building is in fact still standing. Remember, it's not fallen. And actually, only about two or three percent of these buildings did actually fall, compared to forty percent of the downtown contractor-built, even engineered, reinforced concrete structures. Now, the other end of that spectrum, though, what about this? A unreinforced three-story masonry building. In downtown Port-au-Prince, a few blocks from the National Palace, you saw in the newspapers, the largest earthquake-induced crack I could find is that one. This hotel never closed. I stayed in it as a guest in Port-au-Prince after the earthquake. So, what about this? Another form of construction. I'll be talking more about later. Across the street, that downtown Port-au-Prince. So, what about this that I showed before? How didn't the people all die in the informal, illegal settlements in the in their reinforced concrete buildings here too? What about these? But then, what about this? 
How do you even categorize these? These buildings should have fallen down. They're not good buildings. They're unreinforced masonry with uh, reinforced concrete elements that don't form, or form connectivity. And then look at this. This is closer to the epicenter than the five-star hotel that fell down that killed the UN personnel and killed many of the visiting government personnel in Port-au-Prince, in uh, Paytonville, in fact. And you look and then you back out of this and look at more and more. And you're challenged to find a collapsed building. So I did a study of this using the pictometry data that covered the entire damage district without using just the news photographs when news photo photographers look for damage. So it skews the base example. So here, and you see, there's very little damage. Well, why the difference? Well, it turns out, after I did stereo pair reconciliation of these, it was in the steep slopes that you saw the damage, not in the entire database of buildings. So it was a completely different spectrum. Now I realize, after Haiti, as we look at other earthquakes, reinforced concrete buildings can be stronger, but there's a huge database of buildings that are weaker than the poor quality masonry. This is something that we now need to reconcile, I think, around the world. And historical buildings can, in fact, take us to a new technology. So we see here that concrete buildings can in fact be stronger than any masonry building. In, in uh, Japan, rolled up from its, away from its foundation, uh, Yoshi could probably tell us about this, and still intact as a box. And a building in Haiti, in front of the hotel, without even a shear wall, except on one side still standing. Good construction works. But what about all the rest of what we've seen and compare that against masonry? It's really a new schedule. And I want to take you out of Haiti now by showing you that Christchurch has some of the same details that are fatally flawed that brought down buildings and despite all of the historical buildings you've heard about in Christchurch, more than half of the people who died in that earthquake died in one building that was reinforced concrete frame structure that pancaked. Uh, so I'm not going to take you here and describe the kind of work I've done over the last 20 years to study uh, traditional buildings. But I want you to look at the upper building on the upper left and it is of a frame with infill masonry construction constructed in ancient Rome, in Herculaneum, in fact. And I'm gonna draw a comparison, you may wonder if I lost my mind, between this and modern skyscraper, the original skeletal frame construction of which Chicago is famous and the United States is famous for having brought this into the modern age. But in fact, what most architectural historians don't realize that these are in many ways masonry buildings. And for the first 20 years of this kind of construction, they did not know how this would fare in earthquakes until 1906 in San Francisco. And, and I show this because it is emblematic of that kind of effect. The masonry in these buildings is what uh, supports them when lateral forces are imposed on them. And yet, many times the engineers have no way, no idea how to compute how that masonry contributes to the design of these buildings. And over the years subsequent to that, the engineers and the engineering profession have removed the masonry from the problem and designed these buildings and analyzed them only as frames. So here we have a situation which changed 20 years later with the development of reinforced concrete as a frame, a moment frame system that we are now familiar with today. But unlike Corbusier's ideal form, it's gone to a huge size 
and people forget that buildings need walls anyway. So these walls are no longer part of the engineering question. They are left out as architectural finish, but they impose themselves because frame action cannot occur when they're in the building, but now they've been reduced to a gossamer thin layer. They no longer have the substance such that when the walls are in, the building collapsed in Gujarat here, the bare frame remained standing right next to it. The two buildings had been intended to be identical. So we're used to now seeing this kind of scene after earthquakes, including the one here in Sichuan and others throughout the world, such that here in Turkey, you see the crushed um, infill wall. What do we make of that when we, right next door, see this in the seemingly weak, insubstantial, half-rotted out, unmaintained 75-year-old uh, building next to concrete buildings in, in Turkey, where you see this wall having, uh, to use the engineering term, worked and survived the earthquake. And so I, with this proposed, a mitigation technology for modern buildings out of the what I've learned from traditional buildings called armature cross walls. You can read about it on my website. And, uh, but to just show you two examples that prove it. Mexico City, the Juarez Hospital, hundreds of people, women, wives, and children died in this building. Next door, while I was standing there, I turned 90 degrees and photographed this. What is this? Well, this is a subframe and these are the floors, an armature crosswall. This one in El Salvador uh, collapsed, and you can imagine dropping a building uh, 12 feet to the ground, bang, would be a force larger than the earthquake it imposed on it the first place. And so I wondered why the superstructure remained standing. I climbed into it upstairs, a subframe, an armature crosswall had kept that superstructure standing. And now I want to conclude back in Haiti with something that really surprised me, that's even a bit different. You're familiar with these images. These are historical reinforced concrete buildings, collapsed utterly, in this case, because of the frequent thing that we saw all over Haiti. After 100 years of existence, the rebar is all rusted away. How can they remain standing? But what is that? 20 years older than those buildings, this church has probably not been published. The uh, uh, photographers from the news agencies don't find it interesting to find that a building remains standing in an earthquake that supposedly killed 300,000 people that's 100 years old, more than 100 years old? What is it? It's masonry. But it's masonry in a framework of iron imported from France using a system that is somewhat unique. There are three buildings we found in Haiti of this system, though. And from what I learned, that it had been meant to be shipped to South America and was diverted to Haiti. Uh, there are some stories having to do with this. I have actually proposed there be a research project on that building, and it's yet to be done. It essentially arrived undamaged after the earthquake, and standing the same height and almost the same scale as the cathedral that collapsed completely. So historical buildings can lead us into the future. Traditional is modern. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randolph. You really brought forward this issue of uh, the significance of traditional knowledge, and you showed some very good examples that show us how traditional knowledge can be so important as has to be considered. Uh, we always look for new solutions, but there is a lot of wisdom that we have to go, go back and look at.